it's harder to jump through those hoops in the front end. But to your point, like there's going to be less competition because you kind of have to be somewhat local to the U.S. to do these type of things or have somebody who is uh, that you trust. So there's a lot of things that create a moat around it. And when we talk about like fees and margins, it has to be FBM. So you're excluded from any FBA related fees and people are a little less price sensitive because you're doing something customized. Welcome fellow entrepreneurs to the Amazon Sellers School Podcast, where we talk about Amazon Wholesale and how you can use it to build an e-commerce empire, a side hustle, and anything in between. And now your host, Todd Wells. All right, what's going on, everybody? Another episode here with my friend, Kevin Sanderson. He is the VP of marketing at My Amazon Guy now, but he also runs Maximizing E-Commerce at MaximizingEcommerce.com, where he has run 16 virtual events and helped thousands of Amazon sellers learn how to sell better on Amazon. And he's also been selling himself on Amazon for over eight, eight years, which is something we're going to be really diving into because he creates a lot of like laser engraved products and things like that, which is a rather unique niche on Amazon that we're going to dive into. So Kevin, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for that intro. Uh, I, I'm exhausted just hearing my own intro. <laughs> Absolutely. So one of the big topics that uh, people have been talking about lately, of course, is the new Amazon fee increases, which even if you're watching this in a year or two years from now, there'll probably be new fee increases. Um, but these most recent ones are pretty uh, drastic because you see them right up front when you're creating shipping um, shipments into Amazon. And of course, you're working at my Amazon guy, Stephen Pope is uh, selling his Tumblr business that he was doing. So with you being at the largest agency in the world, essentially, what are you guys seeing on Amazon? Is Amazon dead? Is it too late to get Amazon? Or where are you guys seeing it? Well, th this is now kind of cutting into my personal opinion based on my own experience as a seller for years, as well as, you know, what I see at bag at my Amazon guy, I think it's going to get progressively harder as time goes on. And it will always be now will be the easiest time it will be moving forward. And so back in 2015, 2016, when I first got started, people were talking about it was so much easier in 2012, 2018. They always talked about 2015 was better. 2020, it was 2018. You know, uh, recently it's like, oh, like during COVID for some of us, COVID was a disaster. <laughs> you know? So like it wasn't all we have this kind of um, looking back, this fondness, this grass is greener. It was better when it probably was. Now, I think when all these changes happen, if you can't adapt to the changes, you will be left out as a seller. And like. Um, and this is getting away from the fee thing, but just to kind of go on that note is like when I first started, one of the key tactics I employed that a lot of people did was reaching out to people that were top 10,000 reviewers and have them leave you a review. You could send, it basically just message them. Amazon used to give you, maybe they still mm -hmm. do, but you could find their contact information pretty easily back then. And you just reach out to them and say, hey, in exchange for a free product, would you give me an honest review? And it was always kind of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink, because, you know, they're getting free products. Some of them, this is like yeah. what they did for a living practically. And so they would leave really good reviews. I mean, well thought out. And as long as they put somewhere in there, something to the effect of I received a product at a discount or for free in exchange for my honest review, it was kosher. And then somebody did a uh, somewhat of a hit piece on Amazon comparing reviews where they had like looked at like thousands of reviews, whether or not they included that phrase of, you know, the disclaimer. Yep. And it was a huge difference in the average star rating for ones that had that versus didn't have it. So Amazon put the kibosh on the ability to do that. And so they wiped out a lot of reviews. A lot of sellers got wiped out and, you know, 
more recently, a couple of years ago, people were doing a lot with like two-step URLs and all these kind of like, you know, refund tactics. Then they got rid of that. And then now the fees, which they've added other fees. So there's always a change I've noticed. And it's going to, it's going to get harder. Mm -hmm. Amazon has always been a complaint by sellers that they're almost too in favor of the buyer and almost to the detriment of the seller who's, you know, given them the inventory to build the platform basically. And so is it too late to get into it for some, but for some 2015 was too late to get into it. 2012 was too late to get into it. So if you decide it's too late, it is, you just have to use a different set of mindset and tactics than you would have two years ago. And that's always been the case. Yeah, everything is always progressing. Amazon is definitely maturing and it's definitely getting harder. Um, oh, yeah. At the same time, it's kind of getting a little bit easier in ways that you don't necessarily have to be doing all these like gray tactics. Yes. There's still a lot of them that you have to do, but more and more you can just focus on creating a great product, a great listing and market it like crazy. Yeah, exactly. And that's a good point about the gray hat tactics that, you know, not necessarily black hat, not necessarily like, you know, like illegal or something that's going to get you in jail or at the time, things that wouldn't even necessarily get your account or listing shut down. But they were kind of like, eh, should I be doing this? Should I not be? I tried to stay away from those things. And so to your point, they've kind of like leveled the playing field. I almost said cleaned house. But they didn't really like get rid of a lot of people. But if you did those tactics today, you probably would get shut down. Yeah. And so, you know, they're constantly doing that. So it does level the playing field. Now, the thing with fees that's different is it costs you money. It's not just, oh, I can't do this thing anymore. I got to find new ways. It's it could potentially cost you money. And some of them, I think they're just going to have to figure out like the I think everybody was most freaked out about the low inventory fee. Now, as the time we're recording this, that has not gone into play yet. So that will probably be the new freak out. Everyone, myself probably included, will have as to you know what that actually looks like in practice. But the one that really got everybody recently was as of March 1st, the inbound fee for placing, which mm -hmm. that was always a thing. There was always you could select an option that they would, you know, either divide your shipment up or they would charge you and you could send it to one place. The yep. challenge was over time, they were I was having everything just go to one place and I would, didn't even have that setting on. Whereas now they're starting to charge you and they show it to you up front. It's not just an in, you know, invoiced to your yep. account down the road. So that one kind of hits you in the face where you're like, you know, a shipment for a box might have been $20 for you know, one box is now like $40 and you're like, what, what just happened? <laughs> so that, that one does hit you in the pocket. Um, but like anything over time, people are going to figure out how to better manage it, you know, and maybe that's, you got to divide your shipments up a little bit different. You can't put everything that's all the same skew in the same box. You got to divide them up and what that looks like over time, time will tell, but I have a feeling they're going to get enough pushback too, that they're going to, hopefully make it a little clearer. Cause like right now that one, I don't think anyone really understands. Yeah. The, I mean, I, I get what they're trying to do. Obviously sure. they are trying to get you to send the inventory to their different warehouses so they don't have to. Um, and if you don't, then you're paying for that service up front, which used to be free. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely frustrating, especially sending to Canada. So we sell a good amount in mm. Canada. And so when they're splitting those shipments up going into Canada, oh, gosh, get yeah. pretty expensive shipping yeah. over the border, obviously, when I prefer just to send one big pallet mm -hmm. and uh, keep it small. So that can be definitely frustrating. Yeah, it's definitely frustrating. So but like anything, over time, you learn to adapt to it and figure it out. And you know, some sellers got to look at, you know, maybe raise your price. So if, if your goal has always been how to be the absolute lowest price for your product. Now, if you're sharing the buy box, that's a little different story. But if you're if you have your own product and you're not sharing the buy box and you're just trying to have the lowest price in the search results page, that might mm -hmm. not be the best way to do it. And maybe some of these fees also require, you know, sellers in other countries maybe who have been operating at much thinner margins now have to raise their prices too. So there's also a little bit of an evening in the playing field. And we don't know what that fully looks like until, you know, time tells us, but markets 
uh, kind of move with that invisible hand, as uh, Adam Smith, you know, old time economist used to say. Yeah, we'll we'll see how this stands, because obviously uh, Amazon has a history of changing fees uh, mm-hmm. from time to time when there's a lot of blowback. And I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like yeah. blowback from this one. So maybe they'll make some adjustments to it, make it a little easier, a little clearer, obviously. I, I think the harder one is going to be the the low inventory, uh, because, for example, myself, I carry a lot of products from, you know, different suppliers and stuff. And there's some products that I buy along with the better selling products that maybe only sell five, 10, 20 units per month. And so those tend to run out of stock more because obviously I'm not going to order just those by themselves. I'm going to order it when I need the big stuff. Um, so those ones kind of worry me a little bit. Like, is this product that I sell 10 a month, am I going to just start getting hit with crazy fees? Or what happens when my supplier is like, we're back ordered on this for three months, or six months or something, you know, things like that, that that one's just, I don't see exactly how they're going to execute on that properly without messing people up. Well, yeah, that one is one that I've thought a lot about and I've looked into it and Again, anything we say here could be completely different when it goes into practice, just like the inbound fee ended up being a lot different in practice than it was on paper. But at least on paper, if you look back in the last 28 days and the last 90 days, as long as one of them you had supply on average over a 28 day span, which calculating that when you start getting into it, you realize there are some gray areas that they haven't really quite explained, I don't think. Uh, But simplistically, as long as you meet one of the two, so if over the 90 day time period, you were good, but maybe recently you ran out. Well, if you ran out, your sales were zero. So you're actually helping yourself for the trailing 30. So as long as one of those two, you had enough inventory, you should be okay. But that one just feels kind of like kick them when they're down (laughs) type fee. Yeah, yeah, especially with, you know, the, uh, what is it, the FCC investigation currently, it because they're really getting on Amazon for forcing people to use FBA, which they're mm. saying is anti-competitive. And now they're saying, okay, not only do you have to use FBA, but you have to keep the stock that we tell you to. Right, which, exactly. Like, okay, now we're really pushing the boundary here a little bit. Yeah, it used to be you could store years worth of inventory, and I think some people did. Then Mm -hmm. over time, they're like, well, we're not just cheap inventory here. So after a year, we're going to start charging you long-term storage fees. And they've kind of brought that now down to six months, basically. So you start getting hit for six months, but we're also going to hit you if you don't have enough. So you have to stay in this sweet spot. So you know, one thing is, like, I have a warehouse and you have a warehouse. Like you don't need a huge warehouse. Like I have a small one where I've got a couple of rooms in the front and then the warehouse is in the back over there. More people might need things like that and not just, hey, I ship in a container and I, you know, send it into Amazon and I sip my ties at the beach and you just check my laptop every now and then. Those days might be gone for a lot of folks because whether you have a 3PL or Amazon warehousing and distribution or your own warehouse or whatever, you know, you're probably going to have to figure something out to better manage staying in that sweet spot of at least 30 days worth of inventory, but not more than too much. Oh, and if you go above 90 days, that could also affect, you know, your, how much they allow you to send in. So if you think about it, like they have created all these somewhat conflicting initiatives with inventory. It is getting harder to to manage inventory. It's not impossible. It's just, you got to shoot towards a smaller target of Mm -hmm. how much inventory you're going to store at a time. Yep, for sure. Yeah. And I I don't want to spend too much more time on this because I want to talk about your laser engraving, but something that I just thought about was, uh, you know, this is going to make it rather difficult, I think, for retail arbitrage people who can't restock products. Mm -hmm. And But I also wonder how they're going to work it. Let's say you're one of 10 people selling Mm. on a listing. 
Yeah. If you run out of stock, the listing is still in stock. So is that still right. going to count against you? Or are they going to be like, oh, we're good. We got other sellers, you know? How is that going to work exactly as well? Right. Is it based on your stock as a skew or is it based on the ASINs sales and your stock against the ASIN sales in 28 days, which yeah. I would hope it's your individual sales because, yeah. you know, there's too many other variables, which seem would seem to make it more punitive. Yeah. Yeah. But even in that case, it doesn't make sense, right? Because their goal of the fee is they want to keep products in stock. But if there's other sellers Correct. on the listing, the product is still in stock. So why would you punish the person for running out of stock if the product is still in stock itself? So yeah, it's going to be weird. And part, part of it, the game truly is just stay in the game because yeah. over time, these we talked about like, you know, there's constant changes in fees and sometimes they, some bean counter looks at it. It was like, oh, we need to do this fee because we need to reward this. And then they realize, oh, there's this unintended consequence. So maybe to your point, they start finding like, hey, we're losing out on sales of low, low movement products, but there's mm -hmm. enough of them in their catalog that it's now hurting them because sellers maybe don't want to offer them any and they start finding yeah. like it, it hurts our ability to be the everything store yeah. and so i've seen a lot of the pendulum swings and sometimes all you got to do is when the pendulum's swinging just kind of move your head out of the way so you don't get hit <laughs> yeah and and two you know if if this does end up being where a lot of sellers decide to be done and you're the one who rides it out there's exactly that much more opportunity on the other mm -hmm. side yeah, and there's there's constantly sellers coming in and out of the game, and you know some of it is just stay in it. Absolutely. So l let's dive into the laser engraving that you do because it's a pretty cool niche, I think, for no, thank you. selling stuff on Amazon. You do a little bit of Amazon custom, but then you also do mm -hmm. where you're creating the laser engraved products, sending them into FBA and selling them there. So tell us a little bit about how you got into that and, and what that looks like. Sure. So I'll use the example of a phone case. It's not a phone case, but let's just say I laser engrave designs on the phone case. So my first product was a quote unquote phone case. And so and again, not a phone case. I don't even know that I could engrave this with my engraver. But mm -hmm. basically, let's just say it was a phone case. And then I had said to my supplier, like way back in the day, hey, I want to sell other phone cases. Do you have other colors, other things I could do? It's like, oh, we can engrave, you know, designs on the phone case. And so yeah. I started developing a catalog of quote phone cases that had different designs on them. The challenge I was finding is as the catalog got bigger and I'm ordering from China after COVID. It went from, you know, three weeks to airship, you mm -hmm. know, two, three weeks to airship to sometimes it was taking two months to ship mm -hmm. by boat. Yeah. And then the turnaround times to have it shipped from the warehouse because they couldn't always necessarily bring everybody in to their uh, factories that it was taking, you know, longer lead time. So sometimes just to get the product would be over three months. And I'm like, well, that's a lot of cash just sitting there that I, yeah. you know, paying for up front. And then, you know, some products did really well for a period of time and then they got slower. And so they were become slow moving products. But, you know, if they're selling five a month, it might be worth it. But maybe five a month for some products became two a month. And then maybe they would sell pretty decent at the holiday season. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then some years of the holiday season, they sold really well and then sold di didn't sell well. So it was getting harder and harder to manage it. And then they're giving me kind of minimum quantities per design. And so then it became, well, this is getting really hard and I'm carrying a lot of inventory just to keep up with this. And some products move really quickly and some they die. And so then I end up sitting on a lot of inventory because all of a sudden that product just stops moving. And so I got to find some other way to manage this. And so I was like, why don't I just order the quote unquote phone case itself, get, you know, let the phone case be the bottleneck, not the design. And then I can engrave on the back of the phone case. Mm -hmm. And so then I started putting my designs on it and using the laser engraver. And so, you know, hiring staff, like I've got somebody coming in for an interview actually after this, um, after we finish recording here um, and showing her like, Hey, this is what we do, you know, seeing if it would be a good fit for her because 
Yes, it costs me more money to have a U.S. employee engrave than it does a somebody in China, but I don't have to carry as much. And I'm actually still in process over the last years of kind of scaling back how much inventory I actually have to keep in stock at a time because I can send in small quantities. Although not as small quantities as I used to because of the low inventory fee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go, for sure. So you essentially, you've got your warehouse back there. Mm -hmm. You've got a large laser engraving machine. So you take the phone case that you're using as an example, you put it in the machine, yep. you have artwork created, and it just yep. lasers on whatever image you want on there. Yeah, exactly. And so depending on the product and the material that we're engraving, it's usually anywhere between like, let's say 45 seconds and five minutes to engrave a product. And so kind of start backing the math of like, okay, the employee can do X amount. And then my goal is to buy another machine. So to alleviate some of that bottleneck mm -hmm. uh, before the holiday season, um, as I grow the portfolio of products that we're selling that are engraved. Okay. And how much are one of those machines? The kind of machine I have generally four or five grand. Okay, so not too not bad. Not terrible. No. Not too bad. I mean, it's a lot of money for a lot of folks, but not too yeah. bad grand scheme of business equipment. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, the thing I will say is if anybody wants to get into laser engraving, you know, the nice thing is you can also, like somebody calls up and is like, hey, I've got, you know, uh, an event and I need 200 X product engraved. You can be like, sure, I'll do that. And, you know, sometimes I've, those are orders that somehow found me because they saw that we have engraving um, on Amazon. They call me and I get doing large orders that I don't know if they ever made it into Amazon. Maybe they were just, you know, paid through an invoice <laughs> directly. I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> but sure. um, you, you, you do get some of those things, which is nice. But if you do decide to go the route of, you know, buying a machine, whether it's laser engraving or something else, is a lot of these machines take a lot of work to figure out. Like they're usually those type of industrial machines are like, they just assume you already know what you're doing. Okay. So you bought it for four or 5,000, they delivered it to you and you had to yep. set it all up yourself or? Yep, <clears throat> set it all up yourself. Okay. Uh, spent a lot of time on YouTube University, so to speak, of, uh, you know, figuring out the parameters. You know, there's a lot of weird things that'll happen, you know, like, Back in January, the machine just wasn't engraving the designs at all and come to realize, which after a lot of like looking around, it was the basically there's what's called a power supply, which takes AC power from the wall and converts mm -hmm. it to DC power for the basically there's mirrors that move the laser around and that power supply wasn't putting out consistent power and that messed the whole thing up. Now, I'm not an electrical engineer. Trying to figure all that out <laughs> took a long time. <laughs> so there, you, you do end up with weird situations like that or just trying to figure out the parameters of, you know, the laser itself was a, a little bit of a challenge, you know, because you got all these different settings and there's a variety of things that go into the settings. One machine settings are going to likely be completely different than another machine settings and how it reacts to different type of materials. So it took a lot of work to get there, I'll just say. I, I, I kind of enjoy it. it was, it's been a fun journey over time, but it's not plug and play. I'll just say that. Okay. So now that you have it loaded up, though, what it has software that's on like a Windows computer, you're uploading yeah. the image or the text that you want to mm -hmm. engrave and then hit and go? Yeah, exactly. So usually what I do is I have a spreadsheet for production that I'll give to an employee and it's like, okay, you know, these products. And usually I tell them like, okay, like in the name of the file is the ASIN. So like, okay, I want you to make 20 of this product. And then mm -hmm. they'll search for that ASIN in a particular folder. It'll bring up the design and it's already got the parameters and everything loaded. Then they, you know, just make each one. And then I have a, a VA in the Philippines will take our custom orders, which we haven't really talked too much about, but she'll take the custom orders. She'll create the design files for those. And then okay. we just print out the packing slips and the shipping labels. And then basically we just have a process for like, okay, we print these out. Okay. Just make sure we've got the right base product that we're engraving and that's going to the right customer. Double check all that. Okay. Boom, 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 boom. And then now we send those out. 
Okay. Very good. And you're, you find that uh, now that you've been doing that for a little while, process is more profitable than when you were just ordering everything from China already made? Yes and no. So it's profitable in the sense I can do more tests. Mm-hmm. So I don't need to, you know, buy a large, like I have cases of stuff in the back that have hardly moved at all in the last few years um, that I'm just kind of stuck with. So if I want to try something new, you know, I can print out like five units of something and send it in. And if it moves, great. And if it doesn't move, then don't restock it. And so I get to do a lot of micro tests. Mm -hmm. So that's been profitable that way. Now the margins, it does slim down the margins a little bit, but it does help with cash flow because I'm not having to purchase as much at a time, especially for slower moving items that, you know, in some cases for some slower moving products, I was buying more than a year's worth at a time of that particular product just because it was moving so slowly. Whereas now I don't really care if it's slow moving or not. It's, you know, X number of, if I need to ship in three units, I just ship in three units. And if that's enough to last two months, great. And then other products that sell, you know, much more than that, then I just make, you know, I make according to the demand for the product and for the products that it still are moving. I still have the factory, um, engrave some of those too, especially okay. at peak times. Right. So the, the higher velocity ones, you still do some of those from China? Yes. Not all of the ones come from China, but some of them still come from China. And okay. you know, if, I might have them make maybe half of what I need for the holiday season. So that way I'm not stuck in case it doesn't sell as well as I thought it would. But that way it also, because a lot of my stuff is very giftable, that window is hard to figure out as you're getting closer to the holiday season and you're starting to see what is actually moving. And then of course, you know, there's the send-in time, the processing time, the fulfillment center uh, transfer time, all these times before, you know, it actually is up available for sale, you know, yep. fully available, I should say. You don't want to miss that window because you're still trying to figure out like production. So I like to get some of the production ahead of time. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And cash flow, of course, is super important, especially if yeah. you're growing. If you're yep. growing, you either need to take out debt to mm-hmm. grow or increase the time that you're able to turn your cash. Exactly. Exactly. And so the, whether it's a laser engraver or something else, I think for a lot of folks start looking at what are your bottlenecks and how can you solve that? And that's really what it came down to for me is my bottleneck was I'm ordering way too much inventory at a time. And that was getting to be a frustration. And so I don't even know how I figured I landed on laser engravers. It was just, I think I was listening to an audio book about Steve Jobs. And he talked about taking, or the author, we talked about how Steve had taken, you know, inspiration from other places. Like a lot of people have probably heard the story of like a lot of the design elements in Mac and Apple products have come from a calligraphy class that he like took in college. And so he took inspiration from something completely unrelated to computers and it applied it to computers. And so, you know, start thinking about like, going outside of the realm you're in, how might other people make those products and start looking at it? Like, okay, if people sell the product that you sell on eBay or Etsy or, you know, in a Target store, look at that product and start thinking of, are they doing anything differently than how I'm doing it? Because just because you've done it a certain way for several years doesn't mean that's the only way to do it. And so maybe there's other things you could do that could alleviate, maybe not the fee structure that Amazon's doing, but something else that's hurting you because the fee structure ultimately is going to have an effect on cash flow. So if you can do something else, that can, you know, solve some of your cash flow issue or how many you have to order at a time or whatever that is, you know, that even though you can't solve one particular problem, maybe that is the genesis of solving another problem in your business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And with the with the custom side, let's mm-hmm. dig into that a little bit because I've never sold sure. custom before. So how does that process work to set up those listings and uh, get the uh, everything set up and selling? Yeah, so... I was very intimidated by it for years. Like I probably should have been selling custom a long time. Like, you know, it was really only about like right around black Friday last year that I 
even started it. And it ended up going much better than I thought. I thought Etsy was going to do a lot better because people go on Etsy for that. But I realized like people are buying custom stuff on Amazon and Amazon actually has a better custom experience. And so depending on your product and what you're customizing, there's different ways you could set it up. But like for me, I can set up, let's say the phone case and then they can pick what font they want, what message they want, um, you know, a variety of, you know, different variables you can put in there and it will mock it up. And so I think that helps with sales because mm-hmm. Amazon actually made custom uh, products, a pretty decent experience for the customer. And so people think Etsy a lot of times for those type of products, but actually mm-hmm. I think Amazon's a better way to go about. And I can tell you, you know, like in the laser community, cause I listen to a lot of stuff in the laser community, people talk a lot more about Etsy and the debate is whether you just kind of do your own like kind of promotional products, like, you know, serving local customers, or if you do Etsy or your own web store, nobody mm-hmm. talks about Amazon. I think everyone's so afraid of it. So yeah. if you've already figured out Amazon, Amazon custom is not that hard. And so like for me, the hard part was I really didn't do much, if any FBM orders. So having to come up with a new process for merchant fulfilled orders was probably the hardest part for me after figuring out how to set up the listing. But the nice thing is I also learned with that, you could set up templates so I could create templates. So when I create a new version of a product, maybe it's like a different color variation or something, I could just swap out the picture as long as everything else was kind of in the same section, I could, you know, move things around as need be. So it, um, it, it's gone pretty well. So you're, you're creating templates within Amazon? Within Amazon custom. So if you can imagine okay. you're in, you, you create a product, one of the, I think it's the, I forget what they call it, the general info screen, whatever the kind of, not the offer, but the primary information about the product. One of the first questions is customization, yes or no. Mm-hmm. And if you say yes, then it brings up a whole other thing. And then you could create like basically so people could mock up the product. And then I just have like I added an image amongst you know the secondary images that's available fonts. And then I have another one that's instructions that basically says, you know, you know, three lines of custom text, you know, X number of characters per line, we will center it vertically and horizontally, you know, Mm -hmm. one line is mandatory lines two and three are, you know, optional. And Amazon will actually enforce that too. So they can't put in like 20 text or 20 characters, I can only put in 15, because I set it to that. Okay, nice. So when you're adding those listings, it's, it's the same screen as you'd add any other product you just select custom. Yeah, one of the questions is customization yes or no yeah. and you just put in custom now you might have to enroll in customization to see that question right. okay so check your settings it's been a while because it was i had thought about doing customization a long time before i actually did it so it wasn't so my memory could be a little bit off in the sense of like oh yeah i had to first sign up for this before it showed me that because i had been seeing that question for a long time before I actually started doing it. So now that I think about right. it, you might have to enroll in custom first. And once you're enrolled yeah. in the program, then maybe that question comes up if you don't already see it. Okay. Yeah. There, there's probably something to enroll because I don't recall on any of the recent products that we've added seeing that message. So there's probably something that you have to turn on in settings mm-hmm. or something like that. But probably yeah. a quick search for Amazon custom would find sure. that. Oh yeah, you could probably just look up, you know, custom and seller central and I'm sure there's articles that'll walk you through what to do. Yep, absolutely. So once somebody makes an order of something custom, I'm sure Amazon's not sending you the file to upload to your laser engraver. So how does no. that process? What is Amazon giving you when someone makes an order and then where do you go from there? Yeah, so in the packing slip, it'll say like the font and the message. Mm -hmm. So like if I have lines, like for me, it's lines one, line two, line three, it'll have that there. So I just, I tell my assistant, I don't care what they write. And, you know, sometimes it's very heartfelt. Sometimes it's really nice. Sometimes it's awful. I'm like, sometimes I'm like, I don't even know if I'm allowed to ship this, (laughs) but (laughs) customer paid for it. So at least I can say, Hey, customer, all, all we did was copy and paste. So I tell my assistant, copy and paste it. If the spelling is wrong, if the, punctuation and grammar is terrible, just do it. And that has actually saved me. Um, 
the only time I ever get in trouble is like someone's like, no, I wanted a period here and you didn't put the period. So I'm like, just copy and paste it. Um, so she copies and pastes it and then just changes the font and then does a little bit of adjusting because we want it to kind of fill up most of the um, phone case, so to speak. So, yeah. and then centering it vertically and horizontally. So basically just make it look nice. And so far we've had, I think only five stars for that particular, for our first product we did. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And you yeah. Know, people are rave about it because you're, you're giving them what they asked for basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's an awesome opportunity for sure. I mean, there's lots of things that you can get custom made on Amazon and, you know, laser engraving is just one thing you can make, mm -hmm. you know, from custom t-shirts to oh, yeah. mugs and mm -hmm. everything else, you know, yeah. that you can set up and do if you want to. Now I would caution anyone, if you want to get into any of this, do not go the route of, you know, there's like print on demand sites and stuff like that, which I think people do very liberally on Etsy. Mm-hmm. Amazon will shut you down. Like I can tell you, I've had times where like I didn't have a lot of orders and I missed like two of them by a day. And like, it's the worst feeling when you log into your account and you see that your account is at risk of deactivation for, yeah. you know, uh, late shipments. And, oh, and when my machine went down, I had a bunch of canceled orders and I had that, um, that, uh, at the top, but thankfully knock on wood, um, I haven't had any issues other than threats of issues because, you know, I had to cancel orders, but they were understanding. And I put it in a support case to say, Hey, my machine went down and trying to figure out what happened. And they're like, Oh, well, thanks for letting us know. Well, you know, we invite you to come back to Amazon customization when your machine's working. <laughs> yeah. And it was actually it, it, like, it wasn't just like a, you know, a lot Happy of times pace. stellar support responses don't even make sense to what you're saying. Like you yeah. can tell the person like, was looking at the variables of what I said and actually wrote something out that like made sense. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you get good support, sometimes not. So right. maybe support for Amazon custom is a little better than regular seller support. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause they have to kind of customize their, uh, how they're yeah, responding they, yeah. to you. Cause it's not quite, everything's black and white and custom. Yep. Yep. You get custom support. <laughs> you get custom support for custom. Very good. So all right. Anything that we haven't touched on regarding, you know, laser engraving, Amazon custom, anything like that, that people should want to know if they wanted to get into it. Just make sure you have a process. I would be, you don't have to be the one to physically put the orders in boxes, but I would say you want to be in control of that, that either you are in control of it because you have a trusted 3PL or, you know, some other party that's doing it that has a history of getting orders out on time. You don't want to risk your whole account because someone else can't get the orders out in time. You want to make sure you have a process for that. So I would say if you want to get into custom, you don't have to be the one to customize, but you need to be the one to figure out the system. Yeah. And I think it's good too, right? Because it's a, it's a, has several additional hurdles that you have to jump over to start doing it. So if you're laser engraving or creating mugs or whatever the case may be, and especially if you're doing it custom, this isn't something that just some seller over in China could just jump on and start doing the exact same thing very easily. They could, but it's going to be a lot more work than just throwing up any random product and trying to sell it. So a little bit more of a, you know, a gate or a wall around what you're doing that way once you get it all set up. But it does going to take more work to get set up. Yeah, it's a lot more work to get set up because you got to figure out not just the Amazon side of things, but whatever equipment or whatever you're using to customize. And, you know, whether, you know, I've looked into other things too. So whether you're doing, you know, laser engraving or some sort of special printing or, you know, print a garment or something like that, like, they're usually not as easy as just, you know, setting up your, you know, HP or Canon printer and, you know, hooking it up. It's usually a, a little bit more in depth and there's more kind of layers to it. So you, it's harder to jump through those hoops in the front end. But to your point, like there's going to be less competition because you kind of have to be somewhat local to the U.S. to do these type of things or have somebody who is uh, that you trust 
And then also you got to figure it out. So there's, there's a lot of things that create a moat around it. And when we talk about like fees and margins, well, it has to be FBM. So you're excluded from any FBA related fees with this. And people are a little less price sensitive, I find, because you're doing something customized. So people are also looking. So I include shipping and free shipping with all of mine. But some of them you might see like, oh, this person has a lower price, but they're charging $8.99 for shipping right off the bat. And another thing that's also nice about custom, which happens with FBM in general, is that you can also set up in your templates that maybe free ground shipping or, you know, whatever type of first class shipping, but then they could also upgrade for expedited shipping. And that might be enough to even cover your costs of the shipping itself. Yep. So overprice the expedited shipping a little bit yep. and make a little extra on top of yeah, exactly. the profit. And that could go straight to your product. bottom line. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. hundred percent people are willing to pay more. I know I have, I've had some mm -hmm. custom things created on Amazon and, and Etsy as well. And you care a little bit less about the price when you're doing something custom because you just understand yeah. or expect it to be more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I feel like that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that anyone who has experience creating really nice Amazon listings is probably going to have a leg up in the custom space because majority of those people selling there probably are not Amazon optimization experts. Yeah, I think that's pretty fair. You know, some people might be like, okay, they did decent on Etsy or somewhere else. And like, well, why don't I throw it up on Amazon too? And usually if that's their secondary focus, they probably didn't put as much effort into like, you know, the Amazon keywords, because maybe the keywords that worked on Etsy or how you write an Etsy listing don't necessarily translate back and forth. Now, those people probably are killing me on Etsy mm -hmm. and I'm missing the boat because I don't understand Etsy quite as well. But um, that is probably a good point you just brought up. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, cool, Kevin. This has been awesome. Where can people best connect with you? Yeah. So you can always go to uh, maximizingecommerce.com. You can you know contact me there if you wanted to. Uh, we've got events coming up. Uh, in the future, we've got a PPC related summit coming up in May. Um, you can also, uh, from time to time, I make appearances on the My Amazon Guy YouTube channel as well. So if you're not subscribed to uh, uh, My Amazon Guy, go to youtube.com forward slash My Amazon Guy or just look up My Amazon Guy on YouTube and you know subscribe to that channel, which is by far the most comprehensive channel out there, I think, in the Amazon world with by anything you could possibly think of. There's probably a video on. Absolutely. And and I can testify that your your events are great. I've spoken at some of them and yes, you have. a lot Very of really well. good educational information. And they're usually a very good price as well. So I try to make it affordable for folks. Absolutely. All right, Kevin. Awesome. This has been great. I appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate you having me. Thanks, Todd. Absolutely. God bless. This has been another episode of the Amazon Seller School Podcast. Thanks for listening, fellow Amazon seller. And always remember, success is yours if you take it.